Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. What a lovely crowd. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, I would like to dim the lights and get a little mood going, but we are streaming on the internet live as we speak and recording, so um, uh, we're going to keep keep a little luminosity here to, um, to accommodate our cameras. Uh, again, welcome to the 2017 Canelos Virgin's Future Foundation 10 by 10 speaker event. I'm John Losing. I'm managing editor of the Acorn Newspapers and uh, moderator tonight, also a member, proud member of the foundation board. We have 10 speakers, 10 topics, 10 minutes each. It's uh, highly informative, and we think you're going to be very impressed by the experts who will be on stage tonight and the information they'll be presenting uh, to you that uh, will help help guide our community as, as we head into the decades ahead. Uh, we are, after all, the Future Foundation. This is our third 10 by 10 event every year. We've had a good turnout, so we thank you. And it, it, it is bold, forward-thinking community members like yourself who come out and help support us uh, that makes this event a great success. So for those of you who are uh, new to the program, welcome. And for those of you who are returning, um, uh, welcome back. So our program is going to begin momentarily. Uh, Alan Gorin, are you, are you in the audience? He's not here. Okay. Um, so uh, we will begin shortly, but first um, I want to present the uh, president of the Canelo Las Virgins Future Foundation, uh, director of community services for the city of Calabasas. You can see he's dressed for his park duty today, just off the job. Here's Jeff Rubin. A big hand for Jeff Rubin, everybody. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're so happy that all of you were able to uh, to get out here tonight. Uh, it's programs like these that help the foundation prosper and, and move forward um, in our planning for the future. Uh, we are all uh, volunteers. Uh, the foundation, we have 36 <laughs> members on our board, all volunteers. Uh, we have one uh, paid executive assistant. I want to give uh, Karen Malatesta a great hand as our executive director. <laughs> Uh, as some of you may or may not know, but our foundation was uh, founded in 1972, and we have been uh, hard at work ever since. Uh, we have great members throughout uh, four uh, areas of, um, of our communities, and uh, we've got city employees, we've got uh, fire, we have police, uh, we have uh, editors from newspapers, we have business uh, owners, we have bankers, all different types of people that come together with the same common goal is, is serving uh, residents such as you um, and the rest of the community. Some people, uh, we have youth programs, we have uh, other types of uh, senior programs, and it, it's just great to see a lot of familiar faces now over the years coming to a lot of these programs. As John said, this is the third year uh, that we're doing this. Uh, I believe we had about 180 people registered for this program tonight. Uh, the subcommittee did a fantastic job putting together 10 amazing topics for you tonight. So I'm not going to speak anymore because I know you want to get into the program. Uh, it's going to be a great night. Uh, and if you want to participate more in the foundation, there's information um, outside. Uh, you can also go to our website uh, and everything's in our brochure that you have tonight if you'd like to be a participant or, uh, or a donor for the program. So without further ado, we're going to get on with the program. Thank you. Well, of course, our program, all about the world of tomorrow, and our first topic has to do with the business world and, and what it will look like in the future. You know, how will startup businesses gain their footing? Who, who will be the investors? Uh, who will our not, uh, new entrepreneurs even be? Uh, a lot of risk out there. Who will invest in these new companies? If you own Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, you're, you're golden. If you, 
if you had Snapchat and MySpace, I don't know. It, it, it's a very tough environment, and I think we have the expert for you to sort it all out. Speaker Alan Gorin is co-founder of Crowd Invest Summit, the world's largest crowdfunding conference and expo, and, and is an entrepreneur in the crowdfunding arena. He is in, uh, he is involved in more than $200 million in online investment transactions. And, Alon is not here to hand out money tonight, but he, he does promise plenty of good free advice, I, I can assure you that. So please give uh, Alan Goran your undivided attention for our 10 by 10 leadoff topic, Entrepreneurs of the Future. Alon. Hi, everyone. Uh I feel like there's, there's two things there. I worked at MySpace. <laughs> um, not my fault. Um, and and uh, I think this is punishment for me showing up so last minute I get to be thrown to the fire first. So thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, I purposely didn't put together slides because I felt like it should be uh, a little more like a, uh, can I actually grab this mic and walk around? That'd be cool. Um, so uh, turned it on, let's see, um, perfect. So that way I'm not tied to the podium because I didn't do slides anyway, because I'm not a, a slides type of person for the most part. And I felt like if we do it more like a TED talk, I could be a little more active. Now that I've wasted like two of my 10 minutes, um, <laughs> I want to talk about the past for, for a split second. Why did, you know, my talk is entrepreneurs of the future, but who are the entrepreneurs of the past, right? You know, my parents are a good example. They are uh, immigrants who came to this country. My mom's a teacher. My dad started a shop to rebuild auto parts. You know, partly did that because he, hey, Mark, um, partly did that because he, you know, had those skills from where he came from, but also because it's, it's hard for people to come to this country and just get a job, right? So people become cab drivers who you've heard of being doctors in other countries, right? So that's one reason why people became entrepreneurs. But another reason is maybe because they had a great idea, they had some passion about something, right? So that, that's still uh, you know, a use case for the future. And we think about the future and sometimes you know people talk about it very doom and gloom right like there's automation and artificial intelligence that are taking away jobs right and and those jobs end up translating into you know skills people go like well if i lost my job in the factory because of automation i'll get a new skill but really the future point is not as much about getting a particular skill, it's about being able to learn new skills very, very quickly. When an engineer goes to get a job nowadays, they don't give them a test and say, do it right here, right now, like you would do in some employment tests back in the day. They literally will give you an assignment and say, you know, if you can send it to me by tomorrow morning, that would be great. And the reason if you ask a CTO, a technology officer, the, the boss hiring the engineers, why they do that is because they don't really care if you have to Google it to get the answer. They just want to know you could get it done on time. So it's all about learning those skills. And then the entrepreneur of the future, because of that same sort of skill curve, then there's sort of points in time as to how and why that that opportunity can arise, right? I use the social media uh, to talk about how I came up and at a certain point in time, social media became a thing. It became real. All of a sudden, you could connect with everyone on the internet. And I talked about, I, I like to talk about how it doesn't really matter what you focus on unless it, only because it matters that you're passionate about that thing. I. I talk about being a punk rocker at Thousand Oaks High School, there were only 20, 30 other punk rock kids at the whole school. And the second I got my driver's license, I could go meet the kids at Newbury Park High School. I could go meet the kids in Oxnard. I could go meet the kids in Ventura. And all of a sudden, there'd be 100 kids, 200 kids at a punk rock show. And then, because of the internet, I could meet those kids in Washington, DC, in Florida, in Singapore, and all of a sudden there's 25,000 high schools in the country times 30 punk rockers, and we could have a community of millions of people. And that was really exciting. That was that point in time, right, where, where all of a sudden an idea that might not have been able to happen was able to happen. And that's happened a few times. You've mentioned a few of those companies when we started. There's YouTube, there was a point in time where all of a sudden it wasn't crazy expensive to host a video on the internet. There became a point in time where we got internet connections where we could post a video. Um, it, before that, it would take hours and hours and hours to post a video on the internet. And if somebody picked up the phone and called you in the middle of that time, start over, right? <laughs> so, so there was that point in time. So the entrepreneur of the future now 
has no barriers to entry. Um, I had a couple other examples like Uber. There was a point in time, GPS in your phone. Really, the product wasn't any different than picking up the phone and calling a cab. But because there became GPS in everybody's phone, whole industry was created. Because of that industry, Airbnb was created. Airbnb seems insane that somebody that you don't know would come and use your house. But it built an industry and now built the most valuable real estate company in the world. They don't own one piece of real estate. That's crazy. But that's this point in time. And that's what the future entrepreneur has at their disposal. My, my favorite you know, part of researching this, figuring this out, is that the future entrepreneur really has no barriers anymore. And maybe we'll discover new ones. And maybe when I was talking about MySpace, I would have felt that there were no barriers either. But the barriers are so minimal. Now, I want to really quickly ask people, how many of you had an idea today? <laughs> Every single one of you, right? <laughs> Well, really, like, let's look, at, uh, let's look at that first example I gave of Mark Zuckerberg starting that company, right? There's no difference now between when he came up with that idea and the ideas that you guys have had. None of these companies sound like world's changing ideas, right? So when you had that idea today, you worked your way up to a zero, right? <coughs> the idea means nothing now. It's all about the execution. It's all about your ability to execute. It's all about your ability to, to actually do it. And what's great now is that you don't have to have a Harvard education. You don't have to go to Stanford and be part of the Silicon Valley Cool Kids Club. You literally can go online. You can audit classes at all of those schools for free on the internet now. You can go on Khan Academy. You can go lynda.com, one of our big success stories in the region for a company that sold. You can go onto, now it's called LinkedIn Learning, and learn any skill for, if not free, practically free, right? Much less than an education, much less than driving to the university would cost, right? So there's no excuse on the education side. We can all do it. The cost of technology is significantly lower. I was talking about YouTube being an example. Please make sure you give me the one minute warning because I have no idea where I am. Um, the, uh, but, but really, this cost of technology is so dramatically different. The company that I went and got, uh, that I joined at MySpace was the first online karaoke company. The amount of, it cost that company $16,000 a month just to pay for the servers in the server room at the place where they were hosted without even counting the bandwidth part of it, which is just to have those servers in the room, they paid $16,000 a month. That was a barrier to entry, right? They had to raise millions and millions of dollars. Now you could create a plugin to do that in your browser and probably over a weekend use some stuff code that you cut and paste off of Google and build a competitor to that company. So there's no barrier, there's nothing stopping any of us except for our ability to execute. The, there's a term in uh, technology called software as a service. There's almost every single type of thing your company needs as a software as a service. You need accounting software, pay $10 a month. There's probably a free version until you get to a certain size, right? You need technology. You need. Uh, any, anything your company needs, there is a version of it online. So there's no excuses. Now, you did allude to fundraising, right? And uh, going out there and raising money. But because there's no barrier to create something other than your time and your ability to execute and just take that one step at a time and do it, you also have a leg up on the fundraising process because every single person who reaches out to an investor knows the answer that they love to see you again once you have traction or once you've made progress. And the wonderful thing is there's nothing stopping you from getting traction and making progress before it begins. There's ways not only to fake it, but there are many, many, many ways to actually build it. I know a lot of you laughed at me at faking it, but there's a, a uh, there is a term in technology uh, at CLU. Oh, their logo isn't up there anymore. Uh, we do lots of startup weekends, and we coach people up on how to start their companies. And a lot of times, the first sort of part of their MVP, their minimum viable product, is figuring out if there's a market for people to buy it. So you know what I've, we coach people to do? Build a one-page site that looks like you have a product, 
that literally has a form that people have to click on to buy the product, and then when they click on it, something will pop up. We'll even go to the point of making you put in your credit card info just to see how serious you are, and then when you click on it, it'll say, we're sorry, we're currently in private beta, or we ran out of units. Uh, we'll let you know when we launch. And now you've built an email list of people that you know want to buy your product. This is all available, and this is all something you can do. And the exciting thing is, going back to it all, whether you're doing it because you're you're working a job and you want to do something new, whether you're doing it because you're passionate about something, the ultimate lesson in all of this is you are the future entrepreneur. There's no age, there's no 16 year old, there's no 60 year old. The average best, uh, I'm done, the average most successful entrepreneur is actually in their 40s. So don't buy into all the BS. You can do it, everyone can do it, and it's easy now. Thank you. Thank you, Lon. Good job. That was, that was fascinating. We're going to be bouncing all over the board tonight, and uh, uh, we got a good kickoff there from Elon. I want to I want to shift gears now. Really, really take a, a left turn or a right turn, because we do uh, we are living in, in in one of the most politically polarized times in our history. I think we all know that. You can. Um, I'm not done. We, you can blame it on Trump, <laughs> blame it on Hillary, but snowflakes all right, all left. You know, we're not here in this next segment to blame anything on anybody for today's climate, but simply to give insight on how we as Americans should adjust our thinking so as to keep our sanity in the days going forward. And there's really nobody who can put a human stamp on the issues of controversial importance better than Terry Paulson of Agoura Hills, our next speaker. He's a star editorial writer, a PhD psychologist, renowned speaker, author, a political thinker. He spoke to the Kiwanis recently, I think, correct me if I'm wrong about Make America Civil Again, but our topic tonight is politics, pundits, and polarization. So, Terry, have at it. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I, I'm, I'm reminded in thinking about change in the future. Did a program for Nissan Canada. They had every single employee together in Toronto. I'd never spoken to an entire company, so it was kind of exciting. And I opened with this line. I said, I'm deeply concerned about Nissan Canada. And the president of the company looked at me and said, why are you saying that? And I said, because you're all here. It can't be good. No one is working. <laughs> and uh, kind of went downhill from there. But. Um, <laughs> When I talk about change, understand what I told them. Every improvement is a result of change. Not every improvement, not every change is an improvement. The past has value, it'll always have value. It just can't have a veto on what's gonna happen next. There'll be still things we do the same way, and there'll be things that we're constantly changing and having to update, just as we've heard just over the last few minutes. So I'm gonna use some slides. Uh, I, Americans have a short attention span, a constant need to be entertained, and inability to look at anything in depth. Now think about that for a minute in terms of, it used to be in the debates with Lincoln and Douglas, Lincoln, the first person who would speak would have one hour to make their case on one issue. The next candidate would have one hour. Then the other person would respond for 30 minutes. How much do our presidential candidates have? They have approximately three minutes to respond to a question of amazing significance with sound bites. They would then move to the next city and have the next issue. We have become inundated with short information. The attention, the sheer volume of information is going to increase. It's like sipping through a fire hydrant. And it's going to continue to be that way. I don't see any change in that. You, what, this is one of the reasons we tend to isolate what sources of information we receive. We have tribes, people that we relate to, whether it's politics or religion or whatever. And we tend to isolate on the areas that we agree with. And our ability to have conversations with people who are different, not as easy. <laughs> Always challenge. It often happens that I wake at night and begin to think about a serious problem and decide I must tell the Pope about it. Then I wake up completely and remember that I am the Pope. Uh, <laughs> I would have loved to have said to him, did you really say that? That's cool, you know? You know, tilt your hat a little bit. It'll be good for you. But um, 
Here's the key part of that. None of the leaders that we look up to, we are used to thinking of individuals being the individuals that will save us and that provide the information. No individual has all the information that is necessary. Now it increasingly requires teams, it requires people, and yet we still think of an individual. It's the people they bring to Washington that really do things, so we're always talking about teams, and how do you find teams that you respect and you want to work with? You better be good not only at knowing something that is a value, but know how to fit in with other people who are going to allow us to be far more effective. Nothing inspires genius like a tight budget. <laughs> we are in real trouble when it comes to costs and the ability to have money to spend on things that really are important. Because what we have done is we've locked ourselves into systems that are going to create major problems for funding. This was in the Ventura County Pension Coast SOAR. Fewer police officers, deferred road work, libraries shuttered, senior luncheons canceled, higher taxes. The impact of rapidly rising pension costs may soon become obvious. The steep increases will come quickly, adding more than 20 million in unfunded liability costs to Oxnard and more than doubling in Thousand Oaks. By fiscal year 22-23, according to the state's retirement system, that's just to pay the retirement benefits for hours already worked. Debt note is accrued unfunded liability. Present ongoing costs will each year add millions more for most cities. No single expense will rise faster. If you get to the point where that amount of money is going to pensions, what's there for schools? What's there for police? What's there for other areas? We're going to have to deal with some tremendous challenges in the next five years. And it's coming faster than we thought it would come. That requires us to make tough choices because we always think somebody else is going to be there to pay. A government which robs Peter to pay Paul can always depend upon the support of Paul. <laughs> So what ends up happening is we're going to increasingly have more and more people trying to find the funding and sources. But if you continue to tax too much people who are the producers and the job producers, they leave the state. <laughs> this is not good for jobs and for business and opportunity. So what you will see is increasingly finding ways to involve more and more people in sharing the cost. Why? Because if you get things for free, you have a problem. You'll take as much as you can get. If you end up spreading the cost, what will end up happening is people may not want to spend as much in their government areas. You'll find more nonprofits taking over funding of things that are important in our communities because there is not the money nationally and increasingly it won't be there for a lot of things that need to be accomplished. So we're going to look for nonprofits. This is a blessed area of a lot of wealth in this Conejo Valley. And I think you will find a lot more nonprofits become involved in serving. And it gives us the satisfaction. The depression of our age is called learned helplessness. Nothing I do is going to make any difference in what happens to me. I might as well wait till they do it to me, then I can sue them. <laughs> and the result of that is we have a lot of people feeling they can't make America work. So the real challenge is things like creating the belief that you can start companies with a minimum amount of investment. We need to be telling our children, our news should show examples of people who are doing amazing things online starting companies and how they did it and the lessons learned. Instead, all we talk about are the problems. All we talk about are the crimes and the criminals. The Statue of Liberty on the East Coast needs to be supplemented by the Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. <laughs> I would love to see it. Individual responsibility will come back because there's not going to be the funding for a lot of things. So you ultimately, in the upcoming years, you're going to have to be much more resourceful. We're going to look at how we spend our money and what we're going to be doing with that, and I think it'll be important. When the Constitutional Convention proposed limiting the U.S. Standing Army to 5,000 men, George Washington responded requesting the clause that would limit the size of the invading army to 3,000 troops. <laughs> Laughter followed, and the proposal was dropped. <laughs> How many agree the wars we're facing now in the future are going to be very different kind of wars than we've had to face in the past? We are dealing with individuals. One individual in Vegas that could kill that many people and wound that many more with the weapons that are available. You talk about the kinds of things that we are going to be facing. We're going to have to deal with conflict far better. We're going to have to deal with diplomacy. Be strong, but we've got to find a way to deal with diplomacy as well. We also need to be observant because the opportunity, L.A. is a target. When I've talked to people who are in, in the industry, they believe that L.A. is one of the targets for terrorism. You've got New York, you've got, uh, you've got London, and you've got Los Angeles. We have been spared. But that does not mean we will not have to be observant in the future. So that, there are some unpredictable factors that we face into the future, and we're going to need to be dealing with how do we keep people sane. Recent study by George Washington University, the evening news, was monitored for 100 nights. The research found 6,500 negative news items, only 370 positive news items. The conclusion is we are grossly overinformed about catastrophes we can do little or nothing about. 
And what happens is we sit in front of a television and we awfulize. How many of you sit in front? Oh, isn't that awful? Oh, my God, that's awful. <laughs> awful, awful, awful. And the only thing they put on the news are things that are bigger than we can handle. One of the values, we've got Acorn as one of the sponsors. One of the things that I love about Acorn and even our star, what we, we have, is it talks a lot more about local activities and local things. Where do we keep the strength of America? Getting involved locally in the kinds of activities that allow us to make a difference locally. It makes for a strong people. And I think you will find increasingly the budget won't be there, but the people will be there. And we need to be involved in the things that make a difference because that's important. There's anger out there. That's the way this job is, blood. So in terminal periods of boredom and then brief moments of intense experience. Excitement. <laughs> you see, we have taught people that it's frightening to disagree. It's frightening to confront a problem. Why? Because we listen to talk radio, we see people lose their cool, and we don't want to be a part of that. How many of you sit and you're listening and you go, oh, God, I don't want to call? They yell at me. So what ends up happening is we don't say anything. We don't dialogue across our differences. I, I have had great conversations with people who disagree with me politically, and at the end I say, you know, we agree far more than we disagree. Our methods may be different. We need to risk having dialogue and talk to people. I love this one. The search for someone to blame is always successful. <laughs> but it's always the other guy. How many of you agree? It's that party or it's another party. Well, it's ours. It's us. We hold the hands and, and, and the answers to what we're going to choose to do. And the answers are being born every day, every year. We've got people with answers. And we've got to find a way to make sure it happens. I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. <laughs> he was known as a bridger. He put seven people on his cabinet who did not want him to be the presidential candidate. He put the people who didn't like him. Why? Because the closer they were, the less damage they could do. <laughs> and he got a chance to meet them and to know them. The illiterate of the future are not those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. The real challenge is we're going to be living longer. A study that was talked about in the, in the LA Times, the fastest growing demographic in the Uni in, in United States now is the age from 90 to 100. 90 to 100 in terms of increase in number in that area. 3% of them are still working full time, 90 to 100. 1,200 of them are physicians. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to a physician that's 100, you know. We're going to start with bloodletting, then go to something modern. But outside of that, what this means is you keep learning. Kids today are going to have three to six careers in their lifetime because things come and they die. And so the real reality is, what are we doing to keep active? If we live to 100 and we retire at 65, that's a lot of golf. Unless we get involved in something that allows us to continue to be productive, starting our own companies. That's beautiful. Innovation leads to disruption, not being disrupted. Don't be disrupted by others. Do the disrupting. Think about what you can do to meet a need. Think about what you can do to be involved in this community. And together, we will make this area one of the best places you can possibly live. And how many agree it already is? Thank you very much. Another half for Terry, Terry Paulson. I, you know, I've, I've heard Terry a couple of times. I never cease to be amazed. Uh, they say never follow kids or, um, or pets on stage or Terry Paulson. So it, it, it's downhill from here. You know, we do live in such a bubble in the, in the lovely Conejo and Las Virgenes Valleys. It's hard to imagine that uh, any of our neighbors would ever actually want for food. And it's ironic that the topic of, of, topic of hunger would even come up tonight uh, in what is otherwise a very uplifting evening talking about uh, a dynamic future and the exciting days ahead. But not everybody in America is living the American dream, unfortunately, and not everybody has a meal on the table come dinner time. Our next speaker is Monica White. And uh, Monica was recently named uh, interim CEO of Food Share Inc. as Ventura County's food bank. And dedicated to improving our community, Monica previously served as board chair for the Ventura County American Red Cross and also served on the boards for the Museum of Ventura County, the Women's Economic Ventures, Ventura Chamber of Commerce, and the Alliance for Arts. Here now with the topic of hunger at home is Monica White. Monica. I'm pretty sure he said it's downhill after this, after Terry. Thank you for that vote of confidence. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Uh, <laughs> is this on? Yeah. All right, great. Um, yes, I am 90 days into my job. Thank you. It's been a whirlwind of a 90 days. 
And last Friday was actually in a very exciting time. I got to attend a award ceremony at Tierra Linda Elementary. And what they were doing is they were congratulating this elementary school for winning a food drive, and they were presenting them with a garden by Captain Planet. And I don't know if you know who Captain Planet is, but he's green and he's big. And I was up there doing my spiel um, in front of the media, in front of the school the principal, the superintendent, all the school and everything. And this little boy in the back row, second grade, raises his hand. And I'm like, okay, um, I got a lot of things to talk about. One in six are hungry in Ventura County. And thank you, you can, I'll get to you. And he just, I said, is there a teacher who's gonna help me here? <laughs> because what is this little boy gonna ask me? Um, can I go to the bathroom? <laughs> or what's your favorite color? Or Lord forbid, are you done yet? <laughs> so I quickly wrapped it up and I said, yes, Mr. Man, what is your question? And he says, I'm not hungry. I've never been hungry. And I said, I am so glad that you asked or you said that because I'm not hungry either. You and I are very blessed. And a lot of your schoolmates are blessed. But one in six, out of six of your friends, one of you is hungry. And that means the work that you did to do this food drive, to collect 12,000 pounds of food, is so important because you give that to Food Share, and Food Share gives that to other students so they can go to school and they can be just as successful as you. Because it's important for them to wake up and know that there is food on their breakfast table. So I said, thank you very much. I'm so glad he asked that question. <laughs> so let's see, what else do I have? Um, last, I'm sorry, it's not the acorn, but it's also not the star where I'm from from 12 years ago either. But Alicia Doyle, the beautiful and talented journalist, wrote this article, who's actually here tonight. And I am not the face of hunger, but Margaret De La M, who was one of the people that Alicia had um, interviewed. And I wanted to tell you about the story of Margaret. Because most people, when I, you say, who does food share serve? So many people say, it's the homeless. It's the mentally ill. It's the transients. And yes, that is true. But I think what surprises so many people, it's a very, very small percentage of the people that food share serves every month. Who we serve is the working poor. The fact is, is that 50% of the people who go to food share on an annual basis, only go one time per year. That means they're just trying to make that one month, trying to make those ends meet. It may be a electrical bill, an extra high electrical bill because it was so hot out. It could be a legal bill. It could be an unexplained car expense. It could be a medical bill. And they just need to bridge that gap. So when Margaret was able to tell us her story, about how she was, back in the 80s, a food share recipient. She was raising four children all on her own. She was going through a divorce and trying to juggle feeding a family of five, going back to school. She finally gave in and said, I need help. She went to a food share pantry with so much um, trepidation and so much embarrassment and so much apprehension. She had grown up in a professional household and she had come from an affluent family. She did not wanna do this, but she was so happy to find out as most of actually all of our guests find out is that at food share pantries, no one has ever turned away. No one has ever judged and no one is ever critiqued. They are all welcome and they will give you food. They're all treated with dignity and respect, which is the very, very least that anybody can do when somebody is crying for help. Margaret today earned a dual degree. She is a college professor at the Ventura County Community District, and she was so pleased to be able to share her story and hopefully that other people would be able to help food share as well, so this, but in turn, we would help other single moms. I just loved her story. So what exactly does food share do? Somebody, my, the biggest question I've gotten in the first 90 days is what's the difference between a food bank and a food pantry? It's a great question. I didn't know. 
even though I had served on the board and I did find out later. But Food Share is, a, is the food pantry of Ventura County, and that's as recognized by Feeding America, which is the hunger alleviation network that we are a part of. Food Share is like a big, huge grocery store. Okay, bigger than a grocery store. I'm gonna say like Costco or Sam's Club. And what we do is we collect donated food. Last year we collected 11 million pounds of food and then distribute it throughout Ventura County. That equals nine million meals. And how we distribute that is through 200 pantries, agencies, distribution points throughout Ventura County. So seven days a week, there are volunteers, 2,100 volunteers every year, 28 employees, a very small staff, that are crisscrossing the county, picking up, delivering, distributing, do it, going to congregate meal sites, closed sites such as Boys and Girls Club, all in the name of feeding 75,000 people every single month. I love this picture. This is a picture of one of our volunteers at a community market where we give away fresh foods and vegetables. Another one of the thing that we um, are very proud of is the 11 million pounds of food. 97% of it last year was donated. That means that we are, for the last 40 years, have had a phenomenal relationship with growers, farmers, retail markets, you name it. Panera Bread to Starbucks to Vaughn's, Smart and Final, Costco, every single place that has food, we are on direct dial with them. They call us so we can collect it and we can distribute it so it does not go to waste. Oh, I probably should, add, oh, I, I meant to say this, um, Conejo Valley. So we're in an affluent area, I know that. And people always say, oh, there's no, there's no hungry people in, in, <laughs> in the Conejo Valley. That it, we know that's not true, just like it's not the homeless, right? Um, last year, 1.1 million pounds of food was distributed just in the Conejo Valley area. And that was through 28 different pantries and distribution points. So 10% of the entire, of the entire um, distribution was done here in Conejo Valley. That, that is a very big, um, that's a big chunk. Um, another growing market, you've all heard of the silver tsunami that is coming, right? This older generation. Star, um, I almost said the Ventura County Star. I'm gonna get past that. <laughs> food Share. Food Share has been part of a new program. It's called the Commodity Food. No, Commodity Supplemental Food Program. We call it Senior Kits. It's just so much easier. Every month, seniors, any senior in Ventura County, as long as they're over the age of 60, they um, live in Ventura County, and they are under a certain um, income level, can get a monthly box of food. It's 33 pounds. This is everything that's in it. It's cheese, milk, pasta, everything that you can see in there. It's a great box. Um, they can get it once a month. We last, when I first started, we were at 1,200 boxes. Last month, we were up to 2,800 boxes. We can get to 3,500 boxes, and when we're done, it's gonna be almost 1.4 million pounds of food that we're gonna be able to distribute to our hungry seniors. And the great part about this is that the distribution sites, the boxes are so heavy that we make them drive throughs now. So they just come on through, they pop their trunk, we put them in the trunk, and they're on their way, and they have their food. So they're very happy, they tell their friends, and we're growing about 25% every month will be at capacity. I have no doubt within oh, 30, 60 days. Another great thing we do is our rescue. One million pounds of food is donated. That's through churches, food drives, um, our can tree that we do every, every single year. All of the food that comes in has to be checked. We need to make sure that it's not expired, that there's no bad dents, that, it is, um, that is, it's usable. And we always say, would you give this to your mother test? We have organizations from Amgen, Patagonia, um, the Navy, every, hundreds of organizations that come in two hours. They pack the food. They're so happy about it. This is what they do at the end, at how many pounds they have collected and um, 4,000 pounds, 3,000 meals. They're so excited, they love to do it again. I invite every single one of you to come to Food Chair, bring, a, bring a, a, an, sorry, an organization or group that you're with, come volunteer or come see me and I would love to give you a tour because the Monica tour is awesome. So thank you very much.
thank you, Monica. You are awesome. That was fantastic. So so inspirational and um, and uh, what a, what a wonderful service to the community. Okay, so our next topic is is very cool on a number of fronts. Uh, number one, game of drones. How how clever is that? And our, our presenter is Mike Paul. That's Paul with an E on the end. We tabbed one of our own for this for this topic. Mike, of course, a longtime board member with the Canelo Las Virgenes Future Foundation. He's also president of Mobile Video 360, a vid video marketing production and a consulting firm. And my, uh, Mike's latest specialty is drones. And he is an FAA licensed drone pilot. Did you know that? Uh, and he's been involved in the industry since 2015. Over the past two decades, Michael has also been involved in advanced digital technolo technology and was a pioneer in uh, cloud-based solutions. So, Mike, come on up. W will drones be uh, spying on our backyards? Will drones be delivering your next meal at the front door? You know, what else can we say about these amazing machines? Uh, great questions. And with Game of Drones, here is, um, here's Mike Paul. Okay, did a little multitasking here today. So, let's see here. Okay, um, can you guys hear me okay? Perfect, okay, great. I hope everyone's having a great evening so far, the program, we got a full house, terrific. And I uh, hope uh, you're enjoying the speakers. For the next 10 minutes, we're gonna talk about drones. And a lot to cover in that 10 minutes. So hold on tight and buckle your seatbelts because um, there's gonna be a lot of information here quickly. At the end of the presentation, I am gonna provide you a link to get a, a copy of these presentation slides. So take note of that at the end of the presentation. So first, what is a drone? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it could be a male bee, <laughs> let you read the rest of that. <laughs> could be a monotonous speech. Um, you're not going to hear any of those types of speeches here at this event, of course. It could be me in the morning before my cup of coffee. <laughs> I'm sure a few of you can relate to that as well. Or what we're really going to talk about today are unmanned aircraft. So drones are commonly referred to as UAS or UAVs, which stand for Unmanned Aircraft Systems or Vehicles. Essentially, a flying robot. Usually, they're equipped with cameras for photography and videography, but they can perform other tasks as well, and we're going to talk about some of those in a few minutes. So three main categories of drones. Military, you guys are probably familiar with those, the Predator drone, picture on the left. Recreational drones, there are millions of them out there. You probably have seen them flying around here and there. And commercial drones, drones used for specific purposes in various industries. And today we're gonna to focus on recreational and commercial drones. So several types of UAS devices, uh, fixed wing, rotor wing, quadcopters, or multi-copters. And I do have a visual aid. Ta-da! <laughs> so not spying on you. It is not turned on, don't worry. And we are not going to fly over the room today. But this is a uh, Phantom 4, so this is probably, it's a very common drone. You've probably have seen these flying around. So I'm going to leave that right there for now. Now, what's common to most UASs or drones are certain technologies and functions, which include a remote controller, which interfaces with the flight controls and manages the onboard camera. There are controls to automatically take off and land. There's a GPS satellite control that manages um, and helps guide the drone to its destination. And some of the newer technologies may include geofencing, which can prevent a drone from flying in an area where it is prohibited. That's very important, we'll talk about that. So there are millions of drones out there as we know, and they're used by recreational users and commercial users. And under hobbyist rules, um, and I'm gonna go over a couple of those in a moment, um, there are specific requirements. But drones are used in recreation for racing. There are race courses out there in leagues where hobbyists actually race against each other with these drones. And some drones are so small that they actually can fit in the palm of your hand. 
So just a few of the rules here. Um, if you are a hobbyist, you must be 13 years of age or older. Anybody younger than that here? No. We're all good. You must register if the, the drone if the UAS weighs more than a half a pound and less than 55 pounds, although the courts have come down recently and actually put a hold on that ruling, so we'll kind of see where that's going to go right now. And you must fly no more than 400 feet above the ground, maintain visual line of sight, and of course stay away from other aircraft, stay away more than five miles from an airport, and never fly over groups of people, which is why I'm not flying the drone today over you guys. Now, another big one is staying out of restricted areas, such as in fire or emergency zones. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the public concerns stemming from hobbyist use a little later in the presentation. And then this is kind of an important thing too, because with the firestorms that we've had in the last couple of days, you know, you've seen in the past where on the news, people have unfortunately flown drones and caused interference. And that's a real concern with some of the hobbyist activities. So drones have many exciting commercial use applications and we're gonna talk about some of them. But to fly commercially, you must be certified under the FAA, it's called Part 107 rules as a certified UAS pilot. Now this FAA certification began the end of August of last year. And after the first full year, there are now 59,000 certified UAS pilots, including myself, who went through the training and passed the certification exam. And there are some rules that govern commercial use of drones. And here's a few of them. You must be 16 years of age or older, pass the exam as, as I mentioned. Uh, the drone can weigh no more than 55 pounds fully loaded. And there are some others as well. Just a few more, the maximum speed, can't go more than 100 miles an hour, seems pretty fast, but some of these drones can really uh, book it down through the sky, so you, they're, you know, they're, they can move along pretty quick. And one important point is that if a drone fly, flight is for commercial purposes, the pilot must be certified or they are operating illegally and subject to sanctions and civil fines. So the difference between recreational use and commercial use is that um, if you do it for, for money or for part of a business, you must be certified or you will be uh, subject to penalties. Now the popularity of drones has really increased as I think we all know and you can see the chart there and this year uh, in the U.S. alone about 1.3 billion dollars in sales to U.S. dealers. So 79,000 drones were registered this past year for commercial use and there are over 1.1 million consumer drones in the U.S. as of the end of last year and I'm sure with this year, I just saw them on the shelves at Costco, so, um, so I'm sure there'll be quite a few more by the end of this year. So the projection is for continued rapid growth of this industry. So let's dive into some use cases for drone technologies, starting, of course, with real estate. Real estate is a very popular use for drones since it is a low cost way of capturing some amazing photos and videos of properties and their surrounding areas. And that picture on the left is, you might recognize as Westlake Lake. I took that with my drone. So you get some great shots. In journalism, the use of drones is really got a big boost this year with unfortunately all the natural disasters that seem to be piling up. So with hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria, you've seen a lot of news footage of drone footage taking surveys, showing the damage and helping rescuers, and also the Mexican earthquake. <coughs> now law enforcement agencies have started to incorporate drones into their operations for purposes such as crime scene mapping, active shooter scenarios, crowd control, monitoring of targeted areas, among others. And the fire departments <clears throat> have been using drones to help them pinpoint how best to apply to deploy um, personnel in the structure fires and how best to apply water and to also do surveillance in wildfire situations. The use of drones in law enforcement has drawn some pushback, as I think we've all heard, and certain groups are concerned about privacy issues. So more on that in just a moment. But drones have been a, proven to be a great tool in search and rescue. 
and have been credited with finding missing or injured individuals. The drones are equipped with special infrared or thermal imaging cameras and have other tools such as mapping overlays to help rescuers pinpoint location where help is needed. And you can kind of see some examples on there, really uh, some amazing technology to find people missing and drones have served a tremendously important uh, function in that regard. Now with, with agriculture, we know in Ventura County, we've got a lot of agriculture. Another major use case for drone technology and is used to better manage farms and crops. So using special spectral imaging cameras, they can determine the health of their fields and better manage water and other resources to improve crop health and to increase yields. And as the population increases, we have to increase, continue to increase the yields. So this is one technology that's very important for farmers around the country. Now, the future of drone technology includes delivery services. They'll probably won't replace the stork <laughs> for certain kind of deliveries, but companies such as Amazon, FedEx, Walmart, and others are looking to the use of drones to deliver goods. Some countries in Europe are already commencing delivery operations, and it's just a matter of time before you see this technology in the United States. This is an illustration on the right here of an actual Amazon US patent filing um, where they would um, build these regional buildings and the drones would go in and out and picking up deliveries and uh, picking up product and making deliveries. Kind of looks like a beehive. We learn a little bit from the bees. So someday perhaps when you order your pizza, <laughs> down will pop a, um, a drone and deliver those pizzas right to you. So incredible as this might seem, that future is coming pretty soon. But who would have thought that we would see self-driving, fully autonomous cars? And those are coming pretty quick too. And drones utilize the same type of technology. Of course, drones have great applications for cinematography and entertainment. And last February, you might have seen the Super Bowl halftime show. And 300 drones flew simultaneously, controlled by computer. Um, and I, I know I've, I've run out of time, Ed, but uh, I'm going to ignore you for two minutes. <laughs> so, sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> so anyway, 200, we put on quite a show, and I, some of you have seen that. That wasn't live, by the way. They actually had to record that because the FAA wouldn't let them fly over groups of people. So, so that was recorded, not live. Um, some other uses, disaster relief, inspections, insurance, construction, surveying. As you can see, lots of uses for drone technology. Now, the concerns um, are real, and privacy and stealing data is one is a big concern. State and local privacy regulations apply to drones, but there have been uh, violations by hobbyists who disregard these laws, unfortunately. Stealing of data from drones uh, from the wireless transmissions between the drones and their controllers is definitely an issue. So manufacturers are now putting in place uh, special measures to protect that data. Another concern is safety. There have been a number of close encounters of drones with other aircraft or people, which has prompted many of the new rules and regulations governing drone use. Recently, a drone crashed into a Black Hawk helicopter, creating some minor damage to that helicopter. Fortunately, no injuries and no major damage. But reckless behavior by some drone operators have included flights into fire incidents, as we talked about, creating interference with firefighting operations. Security is another concern. Drones have breached security at press conferences. They've been used to smuggle drugs and to smuggle contraband into prisons. Such security threats have been met with anti-drone measures, such as special devices like the one on the top right that emit an interference signal to bring down the drones. And even trained hawks and eagles, bottom left, have been used in Europe to actually snatch the drones right out of the sky. Go on YouTube and Google it and you'll find it. <laughs> Pretty fascinating. So the LA Times ran a front page article a couple weeks ago about terrorist use of drones and their concerns over that. And so drones have been used, unfortunately, by ISIS to uh, drop explosives or other hazardous materials on civilian and military targets. And such uh, drones, as I mentioned, um, have been used by certain terrorist groups. Anti-drone technology will continue to be developed 
to meet these new threats. So I'm out of time, obviously, uh, but I just want to brush on real quick. There are regulations coming. Um, there's two bills pending in Congress, the Drone Federalism Act of 2017 and the Drone Innovation Act. Um, those would manage the uh, uh, height of that where drones are going to be subject to regulation. The state and county privacy laws, all of those are important, but it's still the wild, wild west and regulation is trying to catch up to the technology. So. Last month, I did attend a international drone conference in Vegas, and it showcased a lot of new drone technology and included some great speakers and topics. So the head of the FAA, Michael Huerta, spoke and he said, quote, the future of UAVs will be forged by collaboration between all stakeholders in the commercial drone industry. It's important to recognize that aviation aerospace has always been founded on collaboration. The difference will help bring us all to the middle to find the right balance we're trying to achieve." End quote. So in, in conclusion, drones are clearly here to stay, and they provide a tremendous number of beneficial uses. Showed you a few of those today. But like all new technologies, there is the fear of the unknown, but through good public and private collaboration, we'll find the answers to meet the public concerns while respecting the role, the important that this new technology will have in all of our lives in the years to come. So there's a copy of the link to get the uh, presentation, and I appreciate it. And by the way, happy birthday tomorrow to our moderator, John Losing, who I understand it's your birthday tomorrow. <laughs> so I just wanted to <laughs> a little hand. Thanks, Mike. Great information. Uh, and somebody just says the silver, the uh, silver tsunami. I was thinking of Terry Paulson when I heard that term. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're we're all getting up there, and um, he only knew that because uh, Facebook. Yeah, so we're going to kind of stick with technology. And um, there was a, a student named Anthony Chavetta. He was a high school student in Missouri. And not long ago, he was famously quoted as saying, the need to know what the capital of Montana is died when my phone learned the answer. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty profound when you think about it. If our devices are doing all the work, you know, what do students even need to know anymore? Technology is indeed advanced faster in the past 30 years than in the past 2000, and it rests squarely on the shoulders of our youth, like it or not. Our next speaker is Bob Rumer, an electrical engineer for 30 years and currently a teacher of the STEM curriculum at Crespi High in Encino. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, right? Bob is a former Cal Lutheran professor and has taught a variety of classes in physics, electronics, and bioengineering with the goal of sparking student interest in STEM careers. Here's Bob Rumer with his 10 by 10 topic, exciting new science. Bob. Good evening. I, uh, I never had a fear of public speaking until tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to take a minute and have you think back to your school days, elementary, middle, high school. Think about your science classes and think, what were the memorable moments that, that you experienced during that time? I was asked this question. Uh, as part of a uh, master's of science uh, curriculum and instruction course, it was actually the only useful thing during that course <laughs> because it, it really highlighted that for me it was one thing, dissecting a fetal pig in high school. So whether this, you know, sorry. So maybe for you it was a lab where you blew something up. Maybe it was a field trip to some really cool place you hadn't been. Maybe it was a project that you did with your mom and dad or something like that. But those memories are real highlights. I bet none of you thought, oh, that really good lecture by Mrs. Smith on biology. Oh, that was fantastic. We don't remember how we actually learn science in those classes. So the goal today is to create more of those memories for our students. <laughs> if we can create more of those memories of, for our students in the future, there'll be a different attitude that they have about science. 
There'll be an excitement. There'll be a realization of how relevant it is. There'll be a thinking that, yeah, I can do some science. I can do some engineering. I could build that. I could start that business. So I think we're looking at a revolution here that's as big as the science revolution after Sputnik. But it's very quiet. We hear the presidents always talk about how we need engineers and, and scientists, right? And it's true, but how are we going to get them? The first thing we have to do is make science fun. If science isn't fun, you're not going to learn it. So the answer is STEM, or we think the answer is STEM. Science, technology, engineering, math, mathematics is not just naming all of those subjects. It's using technology and engineering to help you learn your math and your science. So. What are our goals? We want everybody to learn science and everybody to enjoy <laughs> science. We want them to learn by doing science. There's not a scientist alive who learns well by listening to someone talking at them. Like right now, you're not learning much by listening yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> but if you were doing something, it would make a huge impact in your life. We all know that because we probably did have a good science teacher who knew this at their gut level. Research to looked at all those great teachers and said, what's the common thing? And it was learning by doing. So we're also going to look at the relevance and interconnected of science. If it's not part of your life, who the heck cares? How many of you were in a science class and said, when will I ever care about a mitochondria? <laughs> I get asked that all the time. So there's a big shift here, not just in the curricula, but in how we teach. So we want the teacher to not be the sage on the stage. I am imparting my knowledge to you, and aren't you lucky for it? But to be the guide from the side. Hey, how do you make that work? I don't know. Give it a try. And the difference, that little difference, creates a huge difference in the way students see science. So what is STEM? We're going to try and use real world problems, real world issues, so students feel the impact right away. We want to use the engineering design process so students are actually building things and breaking them and fixing them and making them better. We want to have everything hands on, or as much as we can. I mean, you still have to have some lectures, but we really want to emphasize hands on learning. We obviously are going to work in teams because, hey, that's the way the real world does. You can't really discover a lot on your own unless you're someone like an Einstein. And then we want to apply that math and science, which is what we really need to learn. And you'll learn it as part of a project rather than that being the case. Most students think math is procedural. Well, you take the two and the nine, and you add the one, and you got the carry. You got the woo. You got the carry. That's what we view mathematics as. If you talk to a mathematician, it's about thinking. It's about imagination. It's about making models of the world. It has nothing to do with the procedures. Those are just part the tools they use to make things happen. And lastly, we want to teach them that failure is okay. We've been raised in a society where you got to pass that test. Oh, Sally only got a 98. There goes Harvard. So we want to establish, when you build something, I never built something that worked the first time. Yet they still paid me. So we want to go and apply this to, to our students. If our students can make something and it didn't work, no one's going to cry. We're going to say, well, let's figure out why and give it a shot. If there's not an expectation that it's going to work, then failure becomes OK. Once failure is OK, you'll try anything, OK? You'll try and start that business that you don't know anything about how to get to make happen. Okay. So some examples. In physics, I have to teach the mechanics of sound waves. And a great example of that is musical instruments. You can learn everything you need to know from musical instruments. So rather than me drawing pictures and stuff and me having fun on the board, I'll give a project and say, you're going to build a percussion instrument, make it work, and make it play a proper octave. The students have a blast. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> Buy the materials, let them loose. And of course, they have to make those tubes just the right length so that they create the right sound so that when you play this, it makes a good octave. 
I think they'll remember that and maybe they'll remember what a wavelength is and what frequency is and stuff like that. Oh, this picture on the, on the left or on, on your right is a typical entry, entry, intro to engineering uh, challenge. You're given some paper and you said, build something high that can hold as much weight as possible. Smart students take the paper, make four little circles, start adding books on them. And those columns, if they're stiff, can hold incredible amounts of, <laughs> of weight. I did this just this last Thursday. I again handed out paper to the students and I said use as little paper as you can to build a wall that is eight, eight inches high and 10 inches tall. Students used 14 pieces of paper, held up 130 pounds. It was awesome. We had every book I had in my class. Here's this little, this little piece of paper and we had stuff up to the ceiling. So that was so much fun. I ditched my lesson plan for the next day and I said, okay, what can you do with 80 pieces of paper? We had, to, we had to go test it in the weight room with all the football players, 315 pounds, and we had all the football players and all the coaches around watching and clapping. So that's the kind of thing. The, those students in structural engineering are gonna remember those lessons, and more importantly, they'll have a great attitude about science and a great attitude about doing things. So why does this matter? Obviously we want our kids to enjoy science, but our economy is technology based. Look at the technology that went into that farm. We have drones going our far, over our farms so that the, the, the farmers can get a better crop. We took a, um, a field trip for middle school girls to a green pepper farm in Oxnard, and we had seven different subject areas where technology is used in agriculture. There were drones, there were bug guys, there were soil guys. That farmer can predict to the day how many pounds of green peppers he will sell to a market. He says it's completely changed his business, his yield is higher and his profits are higher. So no matter what area you go into, technology is there. We have to know technology. Furthermore, our international reputation depends on it. We're the, we're the country that does this. We're the country that lands on the moon. We like being that and we want to keep doing that. We want other countries to look up to us. We want that leadership position. And it's largely based on technology. It's certainly not based on our politics. <laughs> the, the highest paid jobs are all technical. No matter what list you look at, they're all technical. <laughs> So unfortunately, none of my kids went into them. But if you're fighting poverty, <laughs> if you're fighting poverty, the best thing you can do is not be poor, okay? <laughs> and then if you look at all the big issues today, global warming, energy, medicine, every one of them will be solved by technology. If we don't raise our students to enjoy science, we're not gonna solve these problems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. The youth in good hands uh, with instructors like Bob Rumer. You know, the entire nation uh, did go through uh, that horrific time two weeks ago in Vegas, and we're uh, still healing those wounds. And it makes the appearance of our next speaker on 10 by 10 that much more timely and valuable. James Pico is a resident right here in the Canal Valley. He is an FBI special agent with years of training in counterterrorism and weapons of mass destruction awareness. His current title is FBI Los Angeles Division Weapons of Mass Destruction Coordinator. And if that title doesn't grab your attention, I don't know what will. <laughs> I, I met James uh, when he spoke several months ago at one of our regular Future Foundation breakfast meetings, and I was so impressed, I knew we had to get him back here on stage ASAP. He is, um, he's, he's, he's entertaining, he's knowledgeable, impressive, and here is FBI Special Agent James Pico with our next topic, Safe in the 21st Century. James? <laughs> All right, good evening, and uh, thank you for having me. As you heard, my name is James Pico. I'm the FBI's Weapons of Mass Destruction Coordinator for the Los Angeles Field Office. 
fancy title, wish the pain match the uh, title, but what it really boils down to is I, I lead the team that is tasked to prevent and respond to incidents and threats of terrorism involving weapons of mass destruction. And we'll talk a lot about what that means here in a few moments. But before we get started, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the FBI. I'm glad that worked out. I can find a nuclear weapon, but PowerPoints and Costco, you know, give me trouble. I'm going to talk a little bit about the FBI, because I, it's, I think it's fairly safe to say that most people have heard of the FBI. Um, but you know what? Quite frankly, most Americans go their entire life without ever actually meeting an FBI agent. And, you know, there's quite a few people that argue that that's a good thing. But, uh, you know, here's your opportunity. Ten minutes with an FBI agent. But let's talk about the FBI a little bit. We were established in uh, 1908. We have 56 field offices that cover the entire nation, all U.S. territories. Um, you know, I, I put Hawaii as my last choice because I didn't want to get assigned to Guam or Saipan. So every U.S. territory, everywhere we own property, we have an FBI agent. Um, we have 380 satellite offices, uh, 56 legal attache offices. And it's one thing that most people don't realize, but the FBI does a lot of overseas work. All those, all those uh, legal attache offices cover the entire world. So when there's an incident or there's relations that need to be made with uh, foreign nations, foreign governments, foreign militaries, intelligence agencies, you name it. Those are the agents that uh, do that. Um, we also have four rapid deployment offices, which LA is one of them. So when there is a big incident overseas that requires Department of Justice assets, the FBI is tasked to do that. We deploy overseas quite a bit. Um, our office is one of those four offices, and I've been to many countries, and uh, our, our squad, we, uh, we keep a little map of the world where we put pens of all the places we've been, and we do a lot of traveling. Um, in fiscal year 2016, we had about a little over 13,000 special agents, uh, about 3,100 intelligence analysts, and uh, just under 19,000 professional staff. That includes everyone from our mechanics to our doctors to our, uh, some of our evidence personnel. Um, so it's about 35,000 people that comprise the FBI. In uh, 2016, we had 24,144 federal arrests, and we don't count local arrests that the FBI participates in, but uh, those folks were uh, arrested by the FBI. And the big number that everyone likes to hear is, what's our budget? Uh, in 2016, it was $8.5 billion, uh, which, you know, seems like a big number, but we, we managed to go through it and always ask for more. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, what we're really here to talk about, well, you know what, before, uh, some of our priorities. After 9-11, uh, we, the FBI's really, you know, obviously got, uh, the whole nation got a little caught off guard by the terrorist attacks, and we stopped and we really aligned and defined our priorities. And, you know, the number one priority is terrorism, preventing terrorism. Um, the next one is uh, against foreign counterintelligence threats. There are a lot of countries that are working very hard to steal our secrets, and we're trying our best to prevent the, that. Um, then, of course, cyber attacks is number three, public corruption, uh, protecting civil rights, uh, working in transnational gangs. That's, that's a fancy way of saying criminal organizations. Um, major white collar crime cases, um, violent crimes. That's where I, I started out working violent crime. And then, uh, then supporting our, our, our state and local partners and our federal state and local partners. So those are our priorities. What well, that really boils down to is we do a lot of things. We cover a lot of ground. But we're here to talk about terrorism. There are a lot of definitions out there, but they all boil down to basically the same thing, the unlawful use of force or violence to coerce a government or a population. It's not an attack on a military target. It's not an attack on a, a, any sort of legitimate target. It's an attack on, on a population to change their thinking. Um, but, you know, really, you know, in the wake of Las Vegas, there's been a lot of talk, was that a terrorism attack or not? Bottom line, it doesn't really matter. You know, there are a lot of Americans were hurt in that incident, hurt and killed, and we worked that extremely hard. Um, so, you know what, in, in talking about terrorism, you know, the speaker earlier made a really great point. L.A. is absolutely a very high terrorist target. Uh, you know, D.C. and New York argue back and forth as who's number one, and we, we sort of ignore that bickering. But consistently, for groups around the world and domestically, L.A. is almost always mentioned. And we see it, we've seen it in intelligence we've gathered. We've overheard it in intercepts. L.A. is targeted. And there's really a lot of reasons for that. One is it would be a huge economic hit to the United States. If you shut down the port of L.A. Long Beach and all the commerce that comes through there, those Christmas gifts and those Hanukkah gifts aren't getting there on time. You know, all those products that you want to get, that you expect to get, aren't going to move. And that's not just the port. It's all the systems that support that. 
The other reason is obviously we're a huge population center. I mean, there are a lot of people here crammed into uh, Southern California in an attack on any large venue. Any venue really becomes a large venue in LA. And the third reason, which a lot of people don't realize, is that Hollywood really kicks some people off around the world. I love going to movies, I love watching shows, you know, we binge watch at night. But the bottom line is there's a lot of cultures and, and groups that all the things that they don't like about America and all the decadence and the, the lifestyles that they see are thrown in their face by Hollywood. And so when they're figuring out how they're going to, you know, hurt the United States, Hollywood comes to mind quite frequently. And, you know, for planning purposes, Hollywood counts all of Southern California. <laughs> so, you know, L.A. is absolutely a very big target. But let's move on to my specialty, and that's weapons of mass destruction. Now, one thing that drives us nuts, we're the doomsday squad, we're the folks who work those nightmare scenarios, is the, the implications of the Iraq war. The argument that you didn't find a weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, ah, oh, it drives us nuts because, quite frankly, we can go out here in a thousand oaks and find things that would absolutely qualify as weapons of mass destruction. Um, so, and, and that's really what we tend to work the most. We don't necessarily focus on the military items, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that here. Whoops. What that boils down to, when we say weapons of mass destruction, we're talking chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosives. So in, any use of those things, whether they were originally designed to hurt people or not, in a nefarious, or criminal, or terrorist way, falls under our program. We talk about chemical agents. We break them down by what they do to the body. Because, you know, if we start talking, we're, we're geeks, well, I admit it, you know. But when we start talking chemical names, ethyl, methyl, diphosure, and all, whatever, people glaze over, they, you know, the science teacher will get it. But everyone else, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone else sort of glazes over. So we figure, you know, we talk about what it does in you know, your body. The nerve agents attack your nerves, nervous system. Blood agents prevent your blood from working the right way. Blister agents, pulmonary agents, incapacity agents, riot control agents. We, that, we sort of bring it home like that. And what I really want to talk about, though, is, is the things that are here. Toxic industrial chemicals are our biggest threat because they're here. They're ready to go. Chlorine, for example. Chlorine, if I had to get it, I hate that question. What's the number one threat? Chlorine is by far our number one threat, simply because it is here, we have a lot of it, and it doesn't like people at all. It does horrible things to your body, and it's, you know, we, we does great things, cleans your water. The reason why it cleans your water in such diluted amounts is because it doesn't like living things. Um, so, and you think, yeah, I've got chlorine in my pool, but the difference between the commercial chlorines that you use in your pool is the, is the concentration. You know, we've got lots of pure chlorine. Uh, we keep, I think, a 90-day supply, or I think an, uh, either 60 or 90-day supply west of the San Andreas Fault so that after the big earthquake, we can keep cleaning our water and drinking. But keeping those large volumes of such a dangerous chemical poses a threat. And there are a lot of other chemicals, but in the 10 minutes I have, I can't go into all those. But the bottom line, the takeaway is, we've got a lot of nasty chemical things sitting here that are used every day. I, we, I admit, we take pictures of those trucks with the placards as they drive down the freeway, and, you know, we compare notes. It's, it's very scary. There are some very dangerous items. Um, when we talk about biological threats, it's really any disease-causing organism or natural toxin. And there's plenty of that here in Southern California. And there's plenty of people that want to use these bad things. Uh, um, you know, we sort of get used to the flus, and we get used to a lot of the normal diseases. But what really caught us off guard was Ebola, for example. I mean, everyone was afraid, oh my God, I'm gonna get Ebola. Well, we looked at that as the potential. Could there be a, essentially a suicide Ebola patient coming here for the sole purpose of infecting people? And you know what? We weren't the only ones that were thinking about that as, as applied. And we look at the, the technical feasibilities of all that and whether or not it's a problem um, and address it appropriately. We also look at a lot of toxins, ricin and aberrant. There are lots of things that grow naturally. We're used to castor plants. They're all over. Right? We could do a field trip, and I'm certainly within a mile of here, we'll find a castor plant um, that's producing toxic material. But they're here, we're used to them, but doesn't mean that people aren't trying to use them for bad things. And then radio radiological devices, any, any nefarious use of radiation, and there's a lot, a lot of radiological material in Southern California. It's used for industry, for medicine. We move a lot through in the port. It's here. Um, and then, of, oops, of course, nuclear weapons. That's obviously the Korea situation um, has highlighted that, but 
you know, sadly, there was a time where we really took nuclear weapons off our, our plate because ah, there's no way a group can can do that. But sadly, we're getting to the point where we're we're more and more concerned that a terrorist group could acquire or develop a nuclear weapon. And we worked very hard. We put a lot of energy into identifying that and responding to that threat. But explosives, conventional explosives, are, are the terror, still the terrorist mainstay. People do what they're familiar with, and they stick with that, and we see that. And not a month goes by that somebody's not making their homemade explosives, and they're, you know, some of them are self-correcting issues, some of them are... You know. <laughs> but there are a lot, of, a lot of recipes on the Internet, a lot of folks that are attempting to make explosives. We see that every day. Not everyone's a terrorist. Some are just curious kids, but, um, you know, that, that happens quite a bit. Um, but there are a lot of other threats that we deal with. One of the things I really enjoy about my program is we, we, we do what's called over-the-horizon threats. We look at threats that, what's, what's the threat of tomorrow? Um, now, I put firearms in there because obviously coming off of Vegas, that's still a very common threat and something that we deal with. Um, we've got a lot of resources out there that are still working that case. But cybercrime and cyber terrorism are huge. They're huge threats. We, uh, we realize it, but we don't realize that all the systems that are controlled by our computers and our SCADA systems that, that run everything now, our banking, you know, if we were to log on to whatever, you know, I, I, I threaten my kids by saying I'm going to shut down the Wi-Fi. You know, and I mean, if you imagine you shut down a nation of Wi-Fi, you know, good Lord. Um, but cyber terrorism is huge, and the potential there is, is very frightening. Um, drones. You know, we had a speaker here earlier talking about drones. There are a lot of groups that are looking at what bad things can they do with drones. You know, hey, hey, great. They can fly around, they can carry stuff, they can drop things. Um, we've got folks that are, that are trying to do that, and we're working hard to prevent that. Um, vehicle attacks, attacks on soft targets. And, you know, the interesting thing about weapons of mass destruction is that there, there tend to be two tracks. There's the really high-tech mad scientist track where you need a national level lab to you know enrich your uranium or whatever you need to do that's one tack track that you see but the other track and the his more historical track is what's available um uh, I mean, i we've been working this for years and you studied way back when the phoenicians were fighting whoever they were throwing lie at each other because they had it and we've seen that time and time again. People use the weapons that they have. If they're vehicles in this case, if they may be chemicals that are in the area, um, they're gonna use the weapons they have and what you're not expecting. Um, my program, obviously we would much rather prevent uh, or deter an attack. And that's what we put a lot of energy in. We put a lot of effort into responding to threats and assessing threats. And absolutely, when there's a, a, a threat, we work that immediately and until it's not a threat. Um, and then if there's an incident, we, we have a lot of programs to respond to those, those, everything from if there actually is a nuclear weapon here, we have got a team ready to go that will deal with that device. Um, we, you know, we address it at all, at all angles, excuse me. Um, and then we investigate cases. But the big thing that we need, quite frankly, and I'm, I appreciate the opportunity, is the community. We've got to have the community to support. You know, there's only 13,000 FBI agents, and certainly not all of them are working WMD crimes. We can't do it alone. Now, we've never acted like we could, never thought we could, but we realize that even more now. You know, you know what's normal in your communities. You know what's normal in your neighborhoods. You know what's normal in your businesses, your industry. When there are things that aren't normal, we absolutely need to know about that. And we, we actually we do, we respond to every single tip or lead. I've got several, I call them countdown clocks going on various leads that we have timelines we have to meet. When you call in, when you s provide that information, it is acted upon. We take everything until we're comfortable that's not a threat or there's just absolutely nothing left to go on. Um, with that, I thank you very much for your time, and I hope I didn't go too far over my 10 minutes.
it. It's all I can ever do when I hear James speak. He is he's impressive, and we we thank him for his service. Amanda Sabaker is vice president of Energize California, Southern California's premier energy innovation hub, and it's a it's an eight million dollar project funded by the California Energy Commission that connects and supports clean energy entrepreneurs locally and throughout the area in pursuit of California's energy goals. And um, Amanda is sharp as a tack. She has an MBA from UCLA Anderson School of Management, and she is here to talk about our next segment, Clean Tech Incubators. Now, Clean Tech Incubators is not something you find in a hospital with a kid in it. What it is, is it does represent the future of power generation in Southern California. When you turn the lights on tonight, when you go home, uh, you want to make sure that they come on. Where does the energy come from? Is it green energy? Is it clean energy like it needs to be? Here with Who's Got the Power is Amanda Savaker. Amanda. Good evening. We call our incubated companies incubabies sometimes, so we do play a little bit on the incubator theme. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Amanda Sabak, I'm VP of Energize California, and probably the best place to start is with the place that I work. There's a picture of it, it's in downtown Los Angeles. The full name is Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. We affectionately call it LACI. Um, and it was founded in 2011 as an economic development initiative out of the city of LA. Uh, why would the city of LA create a business incubator and spin it off as its own independent nonprofit? Well, if you go back in time, we had a very strong aerospace and defense industry, which over the last several decades has been decreasing. Um, and the city realized that there was a problem here. We were losing jobs, but we had amazing manufacturing sector, actually larger than Detroit's. We have amazing logistics hub. 40% of our nation's goods come through our two ports. We have an amazing, huge, vast intellectual capital coming out of California. We have more PhDs and scientists coming out of California universities than any other state. So. That's a lot of assets to have in our neighborhood that we're not leveraging. So what they said is they said, we have the nation's largest municipal utility, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Why not leverage that plus all those other assets and create a future that is cleaner and stronger and more resilient? And that's where we came in. So we're an independent nonprofit. And over the last, I guess now six years, we've helped, as you can see, over 65 companies raise over $130 million, bringing that primarily to our great county in Los Angeles, but had some spillover effects to some of our neighboring counties and Northern California. And that's helped create over 1,200 clean jobs. That's the economic development story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> the background. The interesting thing is when I come up and I speak to folks, they always say to me, so what are you doing now that we have a new president? This is the common question. Dennis and I were talking about this earlier. Raise your hand, please, if you have an electric vehicle in your garage. Okay, I am somewhat preaching to the choir. I recognize that. However, I'm gonna forge ahead. I'm here today to tell you that the federal government and the change in the federal government in some ways is the best thing that could happen to us because we have been asleep. We have been asleep at the wheel for years and it's time to wake up. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So, a light bulb, very simple concept. Um, we see it on cartoons a lot. It represents when somebody has a light bulb moment, when they had an idea. The federal government is fascinated with light bulb moments. They give us millions and millions of dollars through SBIR, STTR, NIH, all sorts of various grants to fund activities in universities and research institutes around the nation. State governments do the same thing. We are very invested in our R&D culture here. Very invested. And what's supposed to happen in theory is that that technology finds a home when some entrepreneur walks up and says, hey, university, that's a great idea. Can I license it, please? And we do a tech transfer process, and it's born into a company, and suddenly it comes to market, and you can go to Target and buy it. Unfor okay. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. The reality is a little different. Real light bulbs take a lot of time and energy and money. Ask Edison, thousands of hours. My job 
the first part of my job, is to find the Edisons. So I'm in charge of running Energize California, which, as was previously mentioned, has received funding from the Energy, uh, California Energy Commission to the tune of $5 million with a net total project budget of $8 million. And I focus on Santa Barbara, Ventura, LA, and Orange counties. I am lucky because we have a lot going on here. And my job is to find all the Edisons who are developing new technologies and have ideas and try to help them get to market. The problem is, that's not so easy. The problem is, in technology, unlike what we were hearing earlier from um, my colleague Wong, who's, I guess, not here right now, I'm pointing to his chair. Um, it's a little harder in clean tech. We have a little more challenges that we face. Um, and we know that this is a problem because we're not making progress fast enough on all of our climate goals, our air pollution goals, our quality of life goals. So what's going on? Here's what I see. I talk to dozens and dozens of entrepreneurs every day, every week. I talk to investors. I talk to corporate strategics, venture capital firms, corporations who are looking for technology, people like you and me who just want to buy an electric vehicle and stick it in their garage because they think it's the right thing to do. And the problems are really come down to two pieces. Number one, things get stuck in the lab. If you have talked to somebody in the federal or state government, they talk about the gazillions of dollars, and that is a technical term, gazillions of dollars that have gone into labs, and they never get to market. I call those the paperweights. We have very expensive paperweights sitting in our natural, national labs. The other problem that we have is these technologies are picked up, and the entrepreneurs fail to understand who their customers are. Some of you might, recommend, right, might uh, recognize that Ford there? This is the right audience, obviously, I can see that. The other thing you might recognize is the Betamax. Think about who won Betamax versus VHS. It was not the best product. It was not the best product. It was the more competitive strategic move in a competitive landscape that they took. So. Those things are not enough to deal with climate change. We're not getting the products to market. The other problem we have, which is unfortunately sitting in this room, over 100 of you have them, is our brains. We are our own problem. Yikes, what do we do? Hit the panic button. Humans hate change. We don't want to change. How do you know this? If you are a physician, and some of you might be physicians out here judging from this crowd, you know that if you tell a patient, please change your diet and you will save your life, or continue to eat Oreos and you will die of cardiovascular disease, the likelihood of them actually stopping their Oreo habit is minimal. Not from lack of willpower, not from our brains are trained to have habits. It's instinct, it's what's helped us survive all these years. However, it's our biggest downfall in cases like this where we need to change our behavior to save our planet. Stephen Hawking says we have 100 years before we kill our planet. By the way, the planet won't die, we will. Just a heads up. <laughs> so utilities know about this. Utilities are my friend, I wanna be clear about that. They're a key partner in our work. However, they've been struggling with how to help us as consumers change our behavior. They call us the sleeping consumer. Why? Because we walk around flipping on light switches all the time, just loving the fact that electrons are flowing freely. No, but they just come out of the air and they turn on the lights. This is great. It's not how it works, guys. There's something out there that's got to turn those lights on. All right. We know we don't like change. What do we do? Well. A lot of folks like to walk around and say, I'm gonna convince you. I'm gonna educate you. The reason you're not changing your behavior is you just don't have enough data. <laughs> no. Those are the people who sit there and they have fights about whose data is better. I'm a better scientist than you are. This is both boring and irritating. And most of all, ineffective. The other strategy, are those who are the chicken littles of the world. The sky is falling. This, in this case, the car is driving off the proverbial climate cliff. Look what's happening. You are a bad person if you don't change. How dare you? Look at me and my EV. I'm better than you are. Is that motivating? No. That's obnoxious. Don't do that. Filling people with shame and guilt is also not a good idea in trying to create the clean energy future that I'd like to see and I think you'd like to see. So where do we land? 
We land in a world where if you go political and you don't have the personal, it's abstract. And if you go straight to the personal and you ignore the political, it's self-help. That's not where our future is. We need to wake up. There's a switch on this page for a reason. The switch is in your brain. If you close your eyes right now, close your eyes, everyone. Imagine a sunset. If you do that long enough, your body will react as if it's looking at a sunset. All your heart rate will change. The endorphins will change. This has been shown. You can open your eyes now. Don't you feel better? I'm kind of not kidding. We need to literally practice changing our brains. We need to literally practice living the life that we want to see in 10 years, in 30 years, in 50 years. I practice every day by taking my bike from my home in Claremont down to the Metrolink, taking the bike onto the train, and biking from Union Station to my office. I do that as a meditative practice. I do that for a little exercise, some fresh air. And I do it not only to live my values, but to remind me every day, to retrain my brain every day and rethink how I look at the world. My ask of all of you is to close your eyes every morning before you get up and think, one day, I'm just going to keep practicing. And one day, I'm going to open up my garage door, and it's going to be an electric vehicle. I'm going to take out my garbage, and I'm first going to toss everything into my compost bin. Right? If you broke the pieces of your life apart and added those elements to it, what change would that be? So my last thought is, before I know I'm out of time, is that the, the change starts here, and then it goes to your family, and then it goes to your community. This room is incredibly powerful. This is an amazing event, and it's a real testament to what's happening here in Conejo Valley. But if you think about what you do in changing your brain and then sharing that with your family and then your community, the reason I'm not worried about what's happening at the federal level is because the action is here, in this room, in your brain, in your family, in your community. I don't care what's happening there. We are so much more powerful. I have so much more impact and potential, and we're creating the lives that we want here. So I hope you join me, and you can talk to me afterwards if you have any questions. Thank you. Very nice, Amanda. Thank you. As a Future Foundation, one of our mandates is to keep the dialogue going about the societal changes that our local residents face as we forge ahead in the, in the decades ahead. And, and perhaps the biggest elephant in the room right now is, is the retail sector and whether or not it stands to get the, the same rude treatment um, by the online competition as many of the national chain stores are receiving. You know, in five years, will everything be purchased online or people like me still out there who like to go to the mall because of the human experience? So our next speaker is Tish Cabasis, and she's senior marketing manager at the Oaks Mall and has 19 years experience in the shopping center industry with the Mace Rich Company. Tish holds an MBA from California Lutheran University with an emphasis on marketing. And we don't think there's a better person in the community to speak on our next topic, the new retail, than Tish Cabasis. Tish. Okay, I am here to tell you that the mall is not dead, contrary to reports from the media. <laughs> um, good news is that although consumers are shopping differently, they are still shopping. So I did a bit of research to help prove that point. Um, Fung Global Retail and Technology, <laughs> it's hard to say, but uh, reported in September 2017 that retail sales were up 4.5% year over year in April, and more than 90% of purchases are still made in physical stores according to the U.S. Census Bureau. There are forces that are affecting the mall landscape, though, such as e-commerce, um, value, and experiences. So I can touch on a few topics that um, combat or, or shape what the new experience will be in a shopping mall. Retail is all about what's new and fresh, and it's always been this way. No matter if you're thinking about the market squares in centuries past or today's regional malls, 
uh, success, successful stores endure and unsuccessful stores are replaced with new and better ideas. In great part, that's what's happening today. Uh, retailers like 579 and Contempo Casuals that were there in 1978 when I was a young girl and started shopping there at the Oaks obviously are not there today. And it's, you know, what was made, what made the mall successful in 1978 is not the same. It's, uh, retail is cyclical and will continue to evolve as communities evolve. And we are fortunate to undergo, for instance, as you all know, a remodel in 2008 at the Oaks, uh, where we enhanced the aesthetics as well as brought a 14 seat theater, restaurants and elements to the community that, that you all wanted. Um, so we've also, we've, we've also long viewed restaurants as highly important for experience focused consumers. For quite some time, strong restaurants have been destinations in and of themselves at top properties and we expect this trend to continue. From fast casual concepts and engaging pop-ups and chef driven restaurants, um, for instance, there is a novelty restaurant in Stonewood Center that we just opened called Rock and Brews, which is um, a concept where it incorporates rock and roll with a burgeoning craft beer culture and is owned by none other than Gene Simmons of the rock band Kiss. Um, so it's concepts like that, you know, that, that we look to bring. Now at the Oaks, we're very family focused. We have nine restaurants and fast casual concepts on the property with an addition of one more in 2018. Um, and so retail will always be a large part of the shopping mall, malls, but malls are more than that these days with dining and entertainment, fitness, health, information, classes, services, and more. Uh, the consumer habits are shifting the malls or integrating these categories to meet their guest needs. Another concept um, that is happening in today's market is right sizing, which is a smart answer to the brick and mortar concepts of today. Some retailers certainly are right sizing their store fleets um, and that is impacting some retail properties. but. While the industry is in the midst of right sizing, top destinations will continue to be magnets for people, ideas, great experiences, and great brands. Um, the Oaks, for instance, has seen stores increase their size, such as Apple, um, and then other stores downsize, which uh, such as Lovesack, in order to make that change to expand Apple, we moved Lovesack and made it smaller. But those ended up being um, a really su successful and beneficial story for each of those stores. So right sizing is just part of the changing landscaping in the malls. Um, and we're recognizing that change is the lifeblood of great retail centers. So um, retailers and regional malls are continuing to change and evolve, producing winners and losers. And the opportunities within centers also are evolving as retailers seek to maximize the full price, off price and online strategies. And we continue to see retailers such as Zara, Lululemon, Victoria's Secret, Tesla, Sephora, Apple, place increasing importance on flagship locations, which build brand identity and enhance brick and mortar retail experience. Um, interestingly enough, many of these concepts didn't have any significance in malls as recently as 10 years ago. So um, brands know that shoppers are shopping centers um, and a brick and mortar concept allows them to demonstrate and have tactile opportunities for consumers. And it's not their sole avenue augmenting sales for today's retailer, it's an omni-channel of advertising and revenue streams that the brand seeks to gain. Um, brand identity that established retailers look to capitalize on in our malls is also bringing new concepts. In addition to seeing established brands uh, building more market share, uh, many emerging retailers are seeking out platforms within regional malls that offer the higher foot traffic, uh, within regional malls that offer the higher foot, tra foot traffic opportunities to acquire new customers and present their brands. Within our portfolio, we see dot coms, um, names such as Blue Nile, Warby Parker, Peloton, and Beta rolling out um, 
traditional brick and mortar store locations. And we anticipate this pool of tenants to grow over the coming years. Um, so to date, new technology is driving a great deal of the excitement at our, at our top properties. And we're deliberately making room for emerging tech forward retail concepts. Um, for instance, I mentioned beta, and it's a new concept that really is connecting with shoppers at the Santa Monica Place property, among others. And this new, show, this new idea showcases the newest tech products with a staff of guides trained by manufacturers to introduce their innovative products and let people explore them. Um, today and increasingly in the future, we see digital world of retail as a tremendous breeding ground for new retail stores in our well-located centers. The Oaks being one of them, for instance, where Amazon has just opened an exciting um, kiosk at the center where um, they will connect with customers with their technology products, such as their Echo, Alexa, and Kindle. And they're bringing products out into, into the tactile environment. Um, and our retailers today are incorporating digital into their stores. So customers want the best of both digital and physical shopping. Many stores have, for instance, an online order pickup in-store option. Um, Nordstrom has this plus a new reserve online um, where you can choose items, have them pulled, and then you can go directly in to try them without even ever uh, making contact with, um, with a customer service representative if you didn't want to. Um, Nordstrom's also testing a new concept in West Hollywood where customers can shop the clothes with a stylist, then fit with a tailor, and the items are delivered to you the same day. Um, they maintain that the focus on their, on their customers and um, Bloomberg suggested that this is a way for department stores to not have a lot of overhead and then um, make economic sense for them in new markets that they might otherwise pass by. So it's a great test market to try in West Hollywood for them. Um, another way that stores are incorporating online shopping tactics is through same day delivery and, and scheduled delivery. And so a lot of them are using um, concepts such as Uber, Post mates and to live, which are already established concepts that they can fill the gap and, and not have to invest in the infrastructure behind it. Um, then there's stores like Macy's that are using their locations as distribution centers, and then they can fulfill <coughs> online orders as well as um, the same brick and mortar concept that <coughs> exists at the store that you know. So as technology increases, we have the advantage of utilizing it to gather information to help guide businesses and marketing decisions, of course. <laughs> Eye beacons, geofencing, heat maps showing where the customer is drawn to within the store are tools for choice uh, for the retailers. Social media influencers, mobile devices, and computers help shape a customer's decision and guides purchases. And they're appealing to the millennial customer as well as posturing for the Generation X. And Generation X is looking to be engaged, whereas the millennial customer does not. So stores are doing more special experiences actually in their brick and mortar locations. So for instance, Apple um, is now hosting Today at Apple, which are classes that appeal to people's passions, such as coding and gaming, health and foot fitness, art design, photography, and music. And all, sto all stores have these classes available to everyone, actually, not just Generation X. Um, so we see a shift in, 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 uh, to incorporate experiences and technology. Some of our brands are testing mobile devices. Um, many brands are streamlining the shopping experience and blending the technology into the brick and mortar. And ultimately, there are always disruption, disruptions in the retail landscape. And this is one of those periods in our history. It will weed out those that can't conform or adapt to the new needs of the customer. Thank you. Thank you, Tish. FaceTime or downtime, our next topic as we uh, head down the home stretch. And we had, we had a lot of fun coming up with this topic because it's so true. You know, we're so connected to our devices, uh, but disconnected as humans possibly. Uh, so we call upon the area's leading expert on adolescent thinking, Dr. Blake Brisbois, to uh, make sense of what we're calling, for lack of a better term, 
um, device addiction. Now, Blake maintains a private practice and engage at Engage in Westlake Village. He specializes in working with young people uh, to help them cope with with all kinds of challenges, as you might suspect: uh, depression, anxiety, ADHD, uh, grief, trauma, and other uh, young life transitions. And Dr. Brisbois is an absolute expert in the field of child psychology, and that's why we're calling on him to sort out our next topic, FaceTime or downtime. Blake? Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That was uh, quite the intro. Um, I'm, a, I'm a local guy, so this is kind of cool for me. I went to uh, Lindero Canyon Middle School and Agura High and... Okay, I'm a local boy. <laughs> Um, went to Agura High and uh, went off to college, and now I became a therapist, and I'm back. So um, really cool that I have a voice here, so thank you so much um, for this opportunity. Um, so as a psychotherapist working with teens, um, I deal with stories. I deal with people's stories. I deal with the story of the community and the culture that we live in. Um, but uh, there's also that scientific um, side of me that wants to just throw a ton of numbers at you guys and scare the crap out of you. Um, and I can do that. Um, 2004, right? We were number two in the world in the amount of screen, screen time the average person um, was used, basically three and a half hours a day. Um, Japan was number one. Um, we are up now to over seven hours a day. So we are approaching fast about half of our waking hours being on our devices. Um, we all know that's how we communicate, right? That's how we do business. That's how we shop, as we were just hearing. And by the way, first of all, the diversity of speakers here today was amazing. And the synergy in our message, which is, I think, pretty cool. Um, so I, I got a lot of nods from hearing all of your presentations. So that was really cool. Um, so yeah, uh, seven hours a day, we do everything on our device. Um, but let me go back to stories. That's kind of where I, I like to live. Um, like uh, I was, uh, was mentioned, I work in Westlake at a, at a private practice and a treatment program for teens called Engage. And what I love about my work is I work with about 30 clinicians, and that's pretty unusual in my profession. You know, it's pretty insular usually, pretty isolated. And um, the community aspect of it is, is what I value quite a bit. And working with teens, I feel like I'm in a unique position to talk about FaceTime or downtime. Um, I'm 33, it wasn't that long ago, I don't think, that I was a teen and uh, you know, really into all this stuff. You know, The last 20 years has been this boom, right, of an explosion of technology. Um, I remember a day when you know, I would call my friend and get the answering machine and not be so bummed out, I mean, kind of bummed out that I missed him, but not really think much of it, leave a message and see, you know, just think he wasn't home, you know? Nowadays, right, we have an expectation that we're supposed to be instantly accessible 24 seven, almost. And if we don't get a ping back right away, um, you know, hey, are they mad at me? Are they, you know, what's going on? Um, so there's a lot of kind of neuroticism around um, you know, communication and, and social media and, and all that. And it, it makes me think about the, one of the presentations that was talking about kind of catastrophizing and the, the influx of, of information, right, that we're getting from our social medias, from our phones and all that. And I want to talk to you and, and kind of put your, your mind and, and eyes on social media for teens. Um, it's kind of some, in some ways the opposite of that, you know, where we we're talking about how the news, you know, uh, focuses on the negative, right? Because um, the negative sells and that's what people tune in for and, and, and our brains are wired, right, to look for fires to put them out and that makes a lot of sense. For teens, social media is the highlight reel. Um, it's, it's where everyone goes to show how awesome their life is how awesome the food that they're eating is, um, how awesome their friends are, how awesome the parties are that they're going to, and what they miss is the backstage. Um, every teen feels very viscerally the backstage. They don't see their highlight reel. And developmentally as a teen, social comparison is something that every teenager 
um, almost builds their sense of self upon. Um, so when seven hours plus of that time is connected to devices, watching how everyone else's life is awesome, um, that can be problematic, right? Talking about other presentations or two, I don't want to be the guy that's like, social media sucks, it's bad, um, technology sucks. Again, I think technology is awesome. Um, I said I remember a time in my life when there was no cell phones, there was answering machines, there was yellow pages. Um, you went to places like this to learn things. Um, <laughs> I, I remember that, but at the same time, um, I got really excited when I could use a device at my home to record music, to um, code a website, to um, edit video, to edit photography, things that I would not be able to do without technology. The problem is, is that only 3% of device usage right now with teens is connected to creating. It's all consuming. Um, so you're almost kind of a passive participant. Um, so one of the things I wanna kind of bring up as a community is to find ways to encourage our youth to create. And um, I think uh, you were just saying about how Apple is doing um, some workshops around creating, which is, which is awesome. I want to say too that uh, to not demonize technology, this is not a new thing that we're dealing with. Um, you know, like I said, I think over the past 20 years has been this, the pace at which it's moved has, has been an explosive pace. Um, in some ways, our relationship with technology is kind of at its adolescence as well. Like we're kind of trying to catch up with how to balance everything out. But social isolation, social autism, all these kind of terms that get thrown around, millennials and all that around, um, teens these days and how they, you know, they lack social skills or, or what have you. I mean, there's some, there's maybe some truth to that. Um, you know, for every hour that you're on a device, about 24 minutes of that um, means you're, you're losing about 24 minutes of interaction with an actual person face to face. That's kind of the, um, the math there. So if you think about seven hours, you know, you're losing about three and a half hours of, of face to face. However, again, this is not new, the automobile, right? Prior to the automobile, we had to walk around. We had to like actually interact with people. Now we get kind of like in our cocoon of two tons of steel and glass, right, and air conditioning. Um, social isolation has been kind of a progressive thing. Um, there used to be more meetings like this. Um, there's not, you know, that's been replaced with mailing lists and emails and that sort of thing. So as a community to put some intention into how do we balance out? We're not gonna demonize and in, in fact, I would encourage all of us to start more dialogues with kids um, and ones that are curious. And, and I tell all my parents, because look, at the end of the day, we're adults, right? Um, there's a lot of experience in this room. Um, teens uh, like to, to think and express that they know a lot, right? And a lot of times we're kind of like, eh, you know, we've, we, we've gone through this before. We can kind of see where this is headed. Be Columbo. How many people know Columbo in this room? Right? Act stupid, all right? Like, scratch your head, like, I don't know how this works. Like, teach me, you know? Like, uh, make them the expert, you know? Bring them into the conversation and, and learn from them how they can harness technology and social media in a positive way um, instead of just kind of writing it off because then y y there's not gonna be a discussion. There's not, they're just gonna kinda do what they do. Now, back to some um, frightening statistics just to kind of scare you again. Um, 30% of families feel that they struggle with screen time. Um, one third say they argue about it every day. Um, half of kids self-report that they um, are addicted to their screen. 80% um, of parents believe that they're good role models. If they are higher uh, socioeconomic status, they, it actually goes up, it's about 90%. We're not, guys, okay. Um, <laughs> In fact, um, they did a study, um, and uh, they, it was it kind of makes me a little sad, actually, but uh, they did an app development class in fourth uh, grades and seventh graders, and they asked them to define a problem, and they came up with an, an app that, that offers a solution, right? So their problem they came up with was they felt ignored by their parents, which were distracted by screens. Um, number two problem. Kids often walk into parents' rooms and hear or see inappropriate content on their parents' TVs. 
So their solutions was to come up with an application that has voice recognition that would recognize the kid's voice and then um, shut the, the parent's screen off. <laughs> So again, um, I'm trying to be respectful of time and I'm about done, but um, at the end of the day, we have to, as adults, take accountability um, and look at ourselves. And you know, I just checked my phone just now and I've spent about three hours on my phone today, um, which, hey, I'm doing good, I'm below the average. Um, at the same time, you know, when I talk to parents and I talk to them about skills as a parent, right, that we all could use, there's no such thing as a perfect parent, we all can, can improve. Active listening is, is one of the key things that, that I, are kind of foundational that I try to teach. And that is eye contact. It's putting your phone down when, you're, when your kid, you know, wants to talk to you. And uh, it goes so far. Um, so let's try to be intentional. Let's try to write our own story around technology and... Uh, I have a lot more to speak about, but it's 10 minutes, so that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Blake. That was a great job. Check my email here. So what's up with the drought? Our final topic, and as we head down the home stretch, you know, my word, uh, we're all uh, dying of thirst two years ago than last year. The, the skies opened up and, and, and the rain fell. We have more water than we know what to, we do, uh, know what to do with. Our, our final speaker is David, um, David Peterson, general manager of the Las Virgenes Municipal Water District. And thanks to David uh, uh, for coming out tonight as the chief executive responsible for providing water and sanitation services for more than 1,000, 100,000 people in the region. David literally holds our lives in our hands. I, that's, that's saying a lot. Folks, they don't grow water here in Southern California. Practically all of our supplies come from up north, as we know. And right now, there's just so much fascinating news with the Delta tunnels uh, that they're trying to dig. And right here at home, a proposed plant in Agoura Hills that would take reclaimed water and uh, transform it into drinking water. It's fascinating stuff. Our future really does depend on these topics. And um, here's David Peterson, excellent speaker, and our final presentation tonight, bringing water full circle. David? Thank you, John. Uh, no pressure that I'm holding your lives in, in my hands, um, but thank you for that. Good evening. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, water and the future of water for the Conejo Las Virgenes Valley and what we see as, as our future in bringing water full circle, which is really, in our opinion, the means that we're going to provide reliable water for our future generations here. Um, the project that I'm going to share with you is the Pure Water Project Las Virgenes Triumpho. Um, it is a project of uh, being brought forward by a joint powers authority. It's a partnership of two agencies, Las Virgenes Municipal Water District, which is uh, shown in the blue, and the Triumphal Sanitation District, which is a joint powers authority partner of ours, uh, shown in the green. Uh, the black boundary there shows the Malibu Creek watershed. It's about 110 square miles. It's basically the area where all water that falls within that area drains to a single spot. Um, our key facilities, um, we have, I might switch this mic, is this working? Okay, our key, no? Just hold it. All right, hello, check? No. no. Okay, I'll go back. Our key facilities here are shown, uh, the Tapio Water Reclamation Facility, that's in the bottom left there. That is our main wastewater treatment plant that's in the Las Virgenes Valley. And then the top right is our Rancho Las Virgenes composting facility. We make compost there using our biosolids that are created in the treatment process. Uh, top left is our Las Virgenes Reservoir. And then bottom right is uh, Malibu, uh, um, uh, the city of Malibu and uh, the pier, Malibu Pier and Surfrider Beach that we're all familiar with. Our entire watershed drains to that one single spot, which is very unique. So when we look at water and our challenges with water in this area, water is, is a lot like your investment portfolio. And you've got two pie charts here that show um, our portfolio of water. And so our current situation is we're very dependent on imported water. We rely on imported water here for 80% of our uh, water demands. We're fortunate the region invested early in the 70s in recycling. 
and we are one of the early adopters of recycling. So we do meet 20% of our water demands through recycled water. But really, those are our two sources. We lack local groundwater, which is the crown jewel of most water agencies and usually your most reliable water source. So like your investment portfolio, you want to be diversified. You want to have many different uh, investments, all with different risks, and so that you can manage your risk together. So we're not well diversified. And so this project is really about the future and diversifying in the future. And we do that by taking our local water and the water that we're not currently using, we purify that using the latest technology, the most advanced treatment technology um, that is available. We clean and purify our water so that we can use it more than once, recognizing that we are here on this earth with the water that we were uh, granted and that there is no new water on earth. In fact, all of the water we have here is water that has been used before. So um, for us, our biggest challenge with our recycled water, we have times of the year where we have uh, more recycled water than we have customers who demand that water. Uh, recycled water is, um, flows into our tapia plant roughly at a constant amount. That's because all of you take showers and you bathe and you cook and you do all those things inside of your house. All that water goes through the drain system to our tapia treatment plant. It's really, for the most part, a constant amount year round. The demands for that recycled water, which is right now used primarily for irrigation, for the cemeteries, the golf courses, the parks, the schools, is very seasonally um, dependent. In the summertime, there's a great demand for that water. In the wintertime, especially when there's times of rain, there's almost no demand for that water. Now we need to find a home for that water year round. And so what we do in the winter time and have done for many, many years is we release that water to Malibu Creek and eventually it flows out to the ocean. So essentially, we have a valuable resource we're not putting to full use, and we're releasing to the ocean. We're mixing it with the saltiest water that we have, and it can't be recaptured and used beneficially. So that, going forward, is not really the most sustainable uh, practice. To boot, the other big challenge we have is that we are in the center of, of, of a strong environmental movement, and the Malibu Creek watershed has one of the strongest environmental um, activism um, focuses of anywhere in the entire LA Ventura uh, County region. And for good reason, it, it's a beautiful area. The Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area is something that we're all very proud of. And uh, the Santa Monica Bay as well is a place where, where millions of people come to recreate. Um, so our two key challenges are improving our water supply reliability and meeting regulatory requirements. So we came up with this idea and it wasn't really our initial idea. In fact, we had a completely different idea on what the future held for us and we thought that was the right idea. And in 2015, in January, we put together a stakeholder process where we were intending to bring people together with different backgrounds and different perspectives to help us to figure out how to bring forward our other idea, which I won't spend time talking about. But, um, and we thought at the time they would help us to figure out how to, how to build a, a reservoir and a dam essentially. Um, the concept, though, at its root was to develop our plan or a roadmap to fully use our recycled water, the, part, the portion of that water that we release to the ocean um, and, and currently release. Um, our board at the time, they asked us to propose guiding principles. Ultimately, they adopted them. They're shown here. Um, and I just wanted to highlight uh, a couple. One is uh, partnerships, which are in water, everything. The days of managing water on our own are over. We need to forge partnerships with our neighbors and look wider and further. And then be forward thinking. We need to look to the future. So when we look at the stakeholders, we brought together a pretty diverse group of stakeholders. We, uh, at the time, um, were actually even in litigation with some of these stakeholders. Um, and you know, this, this is not uncommon in the water business. You know, you know water is, is for fighting, right? And so we were actively litigating um, concerns with environmental litigation, environmental regulations with both Heal the Bay and the Los Angeles Waterkeeper. But yet we brought them to the table and we said, let's look at the future together. Um, and we did this with our board and all of these stakeholders. We all sat at a table. We sat at the same level. The board did not sit at the dais, which is where they normally sit, including tonight when I was there before I came here. And the board, we sat at the table together and we worked together sharing ideas and discussing really what is it we're trying to accomplish. And I think one of the other speakers mentioned uh, the same experiences that we found our differences were actually a lot less than our than our commonalities. We shared a lot of the same concerns, and really the differences 
we're really more focused on our um, approach, not really the end result. So what came out of that process was uh, the Pure Water Project. And what the Pure Water Project involves is what's called potable reuse, which is basically taking our recycled water, which was once wastewater and which was once in each of your homes and went down the drain, taking that water, which we already treat uh, and pump into this purple pipe network, which is very clean water, treating it to the next step through an advanced water treatment plant. And that's what's shown in the middle of the map there in the red with the AWT. And it's just, it, it's shown schematically there. Um, the uh, Tapio water reclamation facility that's existing is in the bottom towards the middle. The purple pipe that connects it is existing pipe. That's the pipe network that supplies recycled water to all of our, our you know, green belts uh, throughout the community. Two new pipelines that are coming from that AWT. There's a light blue one that is a new purified water pipeline that would take this highly treated water, which will be the cleanest water in our entire water system, and will take it to the Las Virginis Reservoir. That water will then blend in that reservoir with the existing water that's there, eventually be treated by that, uh, that small box that's above the reservoir, which is our Westlake filter plant, another treatment plant. So this is now the third time this water will be treated and then pumped out to the water distribution system to all of our homes for uh, drinking. There is a waste product called brine. It's a salty waste um, that is really the impurities in the water that are removed in the treatment process. And that's the red pipeline. And that will go all the way to the Santa Rosa Valley to the Cayugas Municipal Water District who has a brine uh, pipeline that eventually conveys that water out to the ocean. So the most common question is, can this be done and can this be done safely? And the, and the answer is yes, we can use technology that has already been used in many other industries, beverage industries, the bottling industry, astronauts, it's used on the space station. We can use technology through a multi-barrier treatment system that can treat the water and make it safe for us to drink, for our kids and, and for all of us. Um, and in fact, make this the cleanest water in our water system. So this is showing the process. Um, the, the far right, the three barriers on the right are um, the three key steps, microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and ultraviolet light uh, with hydrogen peroxide, which is really the three-part treatment process that removes all of the contaminants and uh, destroys any of the, the residual um, compounds that are in your water. So as far as potable reuse in uh, California and across North America, this is exploding. This is the biggest trend emerging in water right now. Um, this is bigger than ocean desal, and we hear a lot about ocean desal. Ocean desal is the brute force approach to treating water. This is the more sustainable option. We use our water more than once, we purify it, and we do what nature has done for millions of years um, to um, provide clean drinking water for us. So for us, our next steps um, involve a lot of work. We need to talk to the community. We need to talk to folks like you and explain what we're proposing. And then we don't expect that you just trust me. We want to prove to you that we can do this safely. And so we're planning to build a demonstration project. We're going to break ground next year uh, and build a small scale treatment plant where we will have all these treatment processes. We will not supply the water to your home. We're going to circulate the water around, but we're going to do every test you can imagine on that water. And we're going to show you the data. We're going to invite you to come and see it. You can see, touch, taste, feel the water, and we will prove to you that it's safe and that this is a healthy option for our future. Thank you. I will drink to that. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thanks to all our speakers. And I think uh, Dr. Blake summed it up best. Um, you know, we, we just don't do this anymore. Face-to-face uh, -face meetings, small room education. Uh, we'll do it again next year. This will be our fourth year next year. So we'll be back right here. We'll see you then. Thank you, everybody, and drive safely. Thank you.